So, um, so thank you guys for coming to our 19th annual author fair. Um, this is the first year that we've actually moved it from June to October. So we're switching it around, seeing what works and adding some new elements to it. So thank you guys for coming on an early Saturday morning. And we have an exciting first panel to start with you. Um, before we get started, I'd like to introduce our first moderator. So Kim Harris is our middle school librarian. <laughs> Kim Harris, she grew up in El Segundo. She uh, went through elementary school, middle school, and high school where she graduated. Kim, this is her home, her home library. So when she was three, she um, started coming here and was able to sign her name at four years old <laughs> when she was able to get her very first library card. So, um, and according to Kim, she still has that card. So, <laughs> so help me welcome um, Kim Harris and she will introduce our authors. Good morning, welcome to our library. And this is my library, I consider it home. It's my home away from home. Okay. Our authors today are Julie Berry, Jade Chang, Ann Clendening, Lisa Freeman, and Peggy Grandy. And they each have written interesting books. <laughs> First, I'm going to talk about Julie Berry. She grew up on a farm in western New York, but now makes her home here in California. She's married and has four boys. She's the proud author of The Amaranth Enchantment, Secondhand Charm, All the Truth That's in Me, the Scandalous Sister of Prick Willow Place, The Passion of Dulce, and two upcoming novels, wow. The Emperor's Ostrich and Lovely War. Her sister illustrated The Emperor's Ostrich. Her first young adult novel, All the Truth That's in Me, was named the 2013 Hornbook Fanfare, School Library Journal, Best of 2013, Kirkus Best Teen Read 2013, and the Junior Library Guild Award. The Passion of Dulce was a 2017 Michael J. Prince honor book, New York Times notable, nominated for the Los Angeles Book Prize, and a Yalsa Best Fiction for Young Adults Top Ten. Wow. Jade Chang was an arts and culture journalist and is now an editor at Goodreads. She's the recipient of the Sundance Fellowship for Art Journalism the Ega Winterhouse Award for Design Criticism, and the James R. Houston Memorial Scholarship from Squaw Valley Community of Writers. Ms. Chang's debut novel, The, Won the Wongs <clears throat> Versus the World, is a New York Times editor's choice, one of Amazon's best books of the year, and a Barnes & Noble Discover book. Wow. NPR said this about Ms. Chang's book. Her book is unrelentingly fun, but is also raw and profane, a story of fierce pride, fierce anger, and even fiercer love. And this is her book. <clears throat> Anne Clendening is a yoga teacher, a former bartender in Hollywood, and a creative nonfiction writer and a columnist for Elephant Journal. She worked in the fashion business for more than two decades, designing, styling music videos, and producing fashion shows. Ms. Glendening is married and has a boxer dog named Sabina. Aww. She has a blog at dirtyblondeinc.com, and Bent is her first book. And her book is Bent, How Yoga Saved My Ass. <laughs> <laughs> Bent is described as being an honest, edgy memoir of coming to terms with her journey through alcoholism, awareness through yoga, and early onset Parkinson's. Mm. This is how Bhava Ram describes the book. Bent is profoundly raw, almost unbearably honest, riveting, irreverent, insightful, and will touch you in places you didn't know existed. The writing style is so brilliant, gripping, and finely crafted, it's hard to believe this is Anne's first book. Buy it, read it, share it. It's a work of art that will touch your soul and help you be better at facing the big challenges that life inevitably presents us all. Lisa Freeman is an author, artist, and teacher. She's an actress and was in films such as Back to the Future 1 and 2 and Mr. Mom. She received her BA in liberal studies and creative writing, her MFA in fiction and pedagogy from the Art of Writing from Antioch University. 
Ms. Freeman is the author of the Honey Girl series, which includes the books Honey Girl and Riptide Summer. The series is about how Nani Nani Nuuhiva, who grew up in Hawaii but, makes, but moves to Santa Monica. She's a surfer but finds out that girls don't surf in the 1970s in <laughs> California. Girls Life magazine describes Honey Girl. In this emotionally compelling, relatable new novel, Nani fights to earn her place in the group, but also to understand and comes to term with who she is. Peggy Grandy was the executive assistant for Ronald Reagan from 1989 to 1999. She was the liaison between Ronald Reagan, his staff, the public, local dignitaries, and world leaders. Mrs. Grandy received her BA from Pepperdine University in Organizational Communications and Business. She is now a keynote speaker and certified consultant for the Fascination Assessment and uses it to help individuals and companies discover and articulate their highest value. She lives in Los Angeles with her husband and four children. The President Will See You Now is her first novel. Okay, my first question. My first question is for all of you. Um, how did you conduct research for your book or books? Because Miss Barry's books are um, historical fiction, at least the two that I read. Want to start? Sure. Um, so I think one of the things that you have to reconcile at the start of researching, I think probably anything, but specifically historical, because that's been my, you know, frequent choice. Uh, you have to reconcile yourself to the fact that you need to go, you need to get as much research accomplished as you can. You need to learn all that you possibly can. You need to immerse yourself. You need to try to explore every aspect. You know, social, cultural, economic, religious, emotional. You know, you you have to you have to you know inhabit a time that you don't live in. So you have to go deep. But you also have to realize that you can't ever go deep enough. You can't ever know all that can possibly be known. You can't even know all that can possibly be known about you know, yourself on a given day, much <laughs> less another time period and place and, and moment that, you, that isn't your own. So, um, so you have to kind of balance those, those conflicting um, feelings that you want to you learn all that you can, but you could spend 50 years researching a period and never be done. Um, and you also have, you know, hopefully, God willing, a deadline. Um, so you've got to get it done and, and, and get on to the next thing. Um, but what I try to do, um, I try to read deeply. Um, I try to read as many different uh, books about a time period as I can. I also try to read what was written during that time period. I try to read the journals, diaries, novels. You know, I try to read the works of people at that time so that I get as close as possible a feeling of how they talked about their time and not just how historians talk about it. Um, I, try, I always try to visit the place where my novels are set. So you'll notice that, you know, my novels are not set in any, you know, really boring places because <laughs> I always want to take the trip there and I want to enjoy the trip there. So um, I think it's really important to put yourself there as much as possible so that you can understand the landscape and the air and, and uh, the smells and, and sights. Every place on earth has its own character. There's something unique about the light. There's something unique about the humidity and about the color of the soil and and the sound of the birds. You know, I, I lived in the Northeast my entire life and moved to LA four years ago and I just couldn't believe how different everything was. Th things I didn't even think about, like mm -hmm. how the air felt in my nostrils mm -hmm. and, and how the, you know, what the sound of the birds was like in the morning. I gotta tell you, we live in an area where there's feral parrots and it's, they're like <laughs> Sauron's birds. You know, oh, <laughs> so I wake up every morning, oh, what's that? So um, as, as much immersion as possible, um, but then also, facing the, the, the reality that you can't know all that you'd like to know, and so you have to focus uh, your research as much as possible and resign yourself to some inadequacy. You know, you're just gonna have to do the best you can. It sounds depressing. <laughs> um, so I don't write historical novels. I, the book that I wrote, The Wangs vs. the World, is contemporary in that it takes place in the late summer of 2008. So a time I lived through, <laughs> so I did know it fairly well, but um, 
I think for me, I really, so the book is about a family that loses their fortune and kind of what happens in the aftermath of that. And it's a cross country journey. It's a road trip across the United States. And um, it goes through a lot of different worlds. You know, there's the world of stand up comedy, there's the world of art, there's the world of um, finance. And I really wanted to render each of those worlds really accurately. And some of them, for example, the art world, I was lucky in that I had essentially been doing research for years as an arts and culture journalist. So that was something that I could just kind of call on past research for. But I'll just tell you one quick story. Uh, One of my characters, the son, the middle child, Andrew, he's in college and he's an aspiring stand-up comic. And I watch a lot of stand-up comedy. It's something I'm really interested in. I got to write a couple of sets for him and that was really fun. But I didn't know what it felt like. He's not very good at first. So I didn't know what it felt like to kind of stand up in front of a group of people and try to make them laugh and fail. <laughs> so, and I wanted to be able to write that feeling really accurately. So I actually took a, uh, th- there aren't very many stand-up comedy classes, it turns out, but I took an improv class. And um, I took it at UCB in Los Angeles, which probably someone else on this <laughs> panel has already ta- has also taken. They're very popular classes. I, um, the first couple of classes, uh, so basically it's eight classes and then a performance. The first couple of classes, I was like, oh, well, this research isn't going to work because actually I'm so funny. <laughs> so, <laughs> but then class number three, I realized, oh, actually, the first couple of classes, all we were doing was kind of pitching ideas of like, oh, here's a funny idea. Here's a funny idea, which I'm not bad at, but. Class number three, we started having to become characters and embody them and act while just coming out with funny lines, which it turns out I'm terrible at. So it was bad for my ego, but very good for research. (laughs) Yeah, so. Put yourself out there. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But I do, for me, that is really fun. I think people talk about method acting a lot, but I find method writing to be really Mm -hmm. interesting, you know, really like putting yourself into the experiences of your characters. Oh, I, I love how you just said that. That's so true. Yeah. That's so true. And also how you said that um, you're, you're never quite done. You know, yeah. you, you could spend 50 years researching mm-hmm. a, a moment in time. And for me, I wrote a very personal memoir. And I grew up in L.A., so I had access to every... every uh, I did a lot of research. And mm-hmm. I, I had access to every research, uh, I guess, component in, in the book. I would put myself in go to the places where I was writing about and sit there and, and I went to the jail where I sat when I was 21 when after I got a DUI and I, I marched in there and I was like I just I told the policeman behind the desk I just want to sit in the jail for a second and, and they had restructured the whole thing and it didn't look the same and I wasn't even in the system anymore it was so long ago and they're like <laughs> I was like can I just sit there and they said no <laughs> but I, I went to my grandparents graves I went I went everywhere and, and um It was really important to me to get back to the feeling that I had when whatever I was writing about happened, you know, to to get back and really feel that feeling. And it was, and it got really dark too, and and a lot of times, but um, it was important for me to do that. I I spent a lot of time doing that. Um, Well, isn't this the most beautiful library? I could (laughs) sit here all day with you. Um, You know, I'm kind of going to piggyback on Julie's uh, ideas. I write historical fiction. I love historical fiction. I do find places that I want to spend time in, but, you know, I was raising two kids and had another job, and I couldn't be in Hawaii, but that's the only place I wanted to be, so I made sure that my novel was completely embossed in the history of Hawaii, even though a lot of it didn't hit the page. And I love doing research. That's why I have Bibles before um, I begin a novel. Political, um, newspaper articles, fashion. You know, in my novel, it's my novels take place in the 70s. But if you're a middle grader today reading the 70s, it could be like reading about the prehistoric days of <laughs> yore. So, because it's a very long time ago. Not and so, so long. <laughs> just, well, I mean, if you're <coughs> under five feet, it could be. Um, 
And my readers are very interesting people. I love my readers, and I cannot mess around with them. They will hold me accountable for anything I say. And so I also have calendars. I have a very specific time period. So then I take the historical fiction and I put it up on my calendars to see which historical event, now that now it gets into like tarot cards, which historical event actually can facilitate my story. And then the two pieces merge and then it's, that's where the alchemy begins with writing. And you know, for me also words, like in the 70s, thongs were shoes and um, <laughs> I had such a thing going back and forth with my editor and my publishers because I kept saying, you know, we're wearing our thongs. And they're like, no, this is YA. And I said, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you can kind of, you know, language is going to be a challenge if you're doing historical. But I find kids, especially my people, my YA and middle graders, they will more easily dive into fictional works than they will modern day commentary and history repeats itself so there's always an opportunity to bring today into print from tomorrow's and yesterday's so yeah so i stepped into a very nervous place of writing about a person that if you google books about ronald reagan i think over a thousand titles come up and of course i've read many of them some are good some maybe not so great, uh, but to step into a place, especially as a first time author, um, to write about a subject that I knew incredibly well, but would I be able to capture him in the way that I saw him? Um, I knew that there were so many books out there that looked at his policies and his him as a president, but I knew him as a person. I was his executive assistant. I sat right outside his office door every day for 10 years in his post-presidency life. And so I knew this man as my boss and as a real life person, not the president. And so would I be able to convey that? Would I be able to talk about him in a way that would bring him to life and to light for people who maybe even disagreed with his policies but could have a new appreciation for him as a person? And so I really had to re-immerse myself in a time that at the time was 27 years prior when I had first started working for Ronald Reagan as a college student right here in Los Angeles. And I had to allow myself to go back and feel it all. And my husband and my four children are saints for enduring this time period. And I'm sure any of you who live with anybody else <laughs> knows that it's an author's accomplishment, but it's also a family or a partner or friend's accomplishment as well, because I really had to immerse myself in that time. And it was interesting because when I first started out, I felt that newness and that excitement that I felt 27 years ago when I was jumping into working for the president for the very first time. And the enthusiasm and the thrill and everything was new and everything was fun. And my um, collaborator that I worked with was very helpful in saying things like, okay, well you talk about jumping on the plane to fly to a speech with President Reagan, but stop and back up. What does that feel like? A little kid from Orange County grew up in a very middle class family. What does it feel like to step onto a private plane and be driven in a motorcade and all these things for the very first time? So slow it down, back up, take our reader through that. And so to relive the fun and excitement of those first early years. And then the middle part of the book is very relational and you know something that seemed so new and fresh. I then stepped into this middle time period where all of a sudden I felt very accomplished and I felt like I belonged there and I felt like I had a place there and was contributing to a place that originally had felt very big and foreign to me. And then of course we know the end of his life. He announces to the world he has Alzheimer's. What does that feel like when the world starts saying goodbye to him and yet I'm still saying good morning to him every day for the next five years? How does this young woman bear the burden and the grief of the world on her shoulders and face her boss every day with a smile on her face? And so the writing process, I really relived that as well. And I woke up some days with that overwhelming burden of having to walk into the office and face somebody that I cared for deeply but knew I had to serve with a smile. And to really relive that, and I'm sure many of you, if you write about anything that's very personal, by the end of the book, you know, I couldn't even lean forward on my keyboard because I was bawling my eyes out and, and typing because it was something that I completely had re immersed myself in. And I never thought I had to write the book. I never felt like I had unfinished business, but I have to tell you when 
I hit the end. I didn't know what the end was. I've never written a book before, but I kept saying to my collaborator, how do I know? I don't even know how my story ends. And she said, surrender to the process and you'll know once you're there. Well, I'm a planner. I worked for the president. Toes on the tape, <laughs> 10 o'clock, that's what you do. I don't know how to surrender to the process, but I did. And when I got to the end, I had this overwhelming feeling of completion. It was done. I hit save. I hit save one more time, just in case. I shut my computer. I walked out to the beach. I cried my eyes out for about 10 minutes, and I thought, I did it. I told my story fully and completely, and this book is different than the thousand books out there about Ronald Reagan because it's my story, and I saw him in such a way that nobody else really saw him. So, okay. Have you guys had that experience, too, where the ending kind of just like appears by surprise? Because I, 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 I really... I know yeah. that feeling, and it's always kind of this little miracle, and I don't know how to explain to someone. You don't, you know, it you're was approaching almost like the, one of those thought bubbles. It was like the light bulb came yeah. on, and I knew exactly what I wanted to use as mm -hmm. the symbolic end, mm -hmm. because in Ronald Reagan's case, as the great optimist, mm -hmm. it couldn't be he died, we cried, the end, because right. that's not Reagan-esque at all. And so, how can he die and we cry? but that not be the end, and how do we pivot to something more hopeful and optimistic? And I literally had like this light bulb come on, and then back wrote into the story another piece that would kind of allude to that. So when we came to that piece, that would be a lot more significant uh, by building it a little bit earlier back into the story. Yeah, that's so cool that happens. Okay. All of them have excellent websites, so uh, that's where I found my information about the authors. And um, if you... Google Julie Berry, the first one that comes up is not the author. <laughs> She's very beautiful in a bathing suit and such. She's an actress. And yes. just Google Julie Berry author. I've, ha I've had like little 12 year old fans kind of traumatized by the experience. Yes, I, said, uh, Julie Berry. I mean, not, yeah, maybe, I don't know. But we've had some shockeroos there. So yeah, Julie Berry author. And well. Clendening also is not the first one, the author that comes up. Yeah. There's another actress with the same name. It's, it's Anna Clendenning, and she's yeah. on X Factor. She's a singer, and oh, wow. I get tagged by, for her all the time. Uh -huh. <laughs> Anna Clendenning. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, our next question. What is your writing process? Do you outline your book? Do you have a general idea of where you're going? Or do you go with the flow as you're writing, as you're moving along? For all of you. <laughs> I'll start. Um, so I think you guys have probably, if, if you're writers at all, um, or if you're sort of interested in writing, it's likely that you've heard the terms pantser and plotter, which are kind of the two schools of writing, you know, whether you like to fly by the seat of your pants or whether you like to plot things out. Um, I think definitely in the YA world especially, those, those terms are talked about a lot. Uh, I am definitely a plotter. I like to have an outline, and the reason I like to have an outline, in part, I think it's because I grew up in LA, a lot of my friends are screenwriters and TV writers, and in that world, the outline is kind of king. You know, you have to have an outline no matter what. I like it because my goal is to always write a literary page turner. I want to write something where you're like, okay, what happens next? What happens next? What happens next? While still kind of feeling a lot of emotion and, and going through a complex story. And for me, the way to kind of build that, that drive, that, um, that kind of desire to turn the page is by me knowing where I'm going. You know, so if I have a goal, then then I have a sort of, I, I kind of like put that goal in the reader's mind as well. And I think that it, it was also easy with this book because it's a road trip, you know, so there literally, there is literally a map. They're going <laughs> from place to place. Um, but I think also a lot of times when people think about outlines, they think that it's confining, that it'll kind of stop up their creativity, it'll stop them from kind of exploring avenues. But for me, you know, okay, so let's just say I told you guys that I was going to San Francisco. There's so many ways I could get there, right? I could walk, I could drive, I could fly, I could hitchhike, I could take a train, I could swim, <laughs> you know? So knowing where you're going doesn't mean that you can't like get, get creative with the way that you get there. Yeah. And what else? I'm a little bit of both. Yeah. I'm a combo plate. Um, I like to wander in the beginning. I love starting novels because 
it's my wandering time where I get to just look at pictures and think and write very fragmented. But then I ultimately, because I'm on such a time schedule now, I don't get to wander for long. I have to get to work. And um, I do have my own little grid. And um, I use that grid now to teach other authors and writers. And going through it consistently over and over again has proven to be a really good loose map. Um, mm -hmm. It's sort of like once you learn ballet and you know the bar, and basic simple moves that you do every day over and over again, you begin to assimilate them in a kind of organic fashion. I just know at the beginning, I start at the point of no return. That is always where my books are gonna start. They are going to kick out into a non-negotiable spot for the character. That's right. And at the very end, there will be resolution. Uh, how that resolution evolves is part of the process. And I also know that in the middle of the book, and if you look at John Green's YA books, you can count it out. It, it's, very, it's very apparent, even though I don't know what kind of grid he works on. But in the middle of the book, there will be you know, total devastation. There will be a plot, a place of hell, a place of uh, unrelenting uh, conflict that will propel my characters into the second half of the book. So there are certain landmarks that I know I've got to hit, and then how I do that, well, good luck to us all. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, um, I, I think I'm ma mainly a, a pantser. Um, I, so I was trying to think how to tie this into like you know examples from, from my actual books. Um, well. I think of the brain as having, you know, I don't mean the two sides like left and right. I can never even remember which one's which. But I think that there's a side of me as a writer that is, um, that is emotional and mystical, imaginative, um, that's you know, that's like the side that dreams, the side that's weird, the side, well, they're both weird, but the <laughs> side that's, you know, that's more on a sort of spiritual, colorful, and emotional plane that can get the good stuff, that, that the juicy ideas come from that place. And then there's another side that in my case is probably like really underdeveloped that you know plans its way through the day and makes a to-do list. And so I try to ride that first brain as far as I can because I think that's where there's something original. I think that's where, that's where the good stuff is. So I actually, as much as possible, I write an entire first draft winging it and just listening to those weird, dreamlike, you know, um, nebulous kind of thoughts or irreverent thoughts or silly thoughts or whatever it is, but I try to ride that through a whole first draft. And of course, obviously, sometimes I have to stop and make some decisions, like you know, what's going to happen next, or if it's a mystery, like, duh, I need some clues and blah, blah, blah. But I try to write a whole first draft on that. And then I go back and I activate the other side and I make a rigorous outline of what I have and then I compare that to what it ought to be, and I cut, 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 and I shape, and I revise, and I reorganize, and I throw chapters out, and, and I bring in that thinker. Um, but I try to hold them at bay until I've gotten whatever I can get out of, out of that, other, that first side. Because in some ways, I think that first side is what's most uniquely me, and, and almost any competent writer could come in and do the second part. You know, it's like good editorial organization. It's not that it's not, not me, but I feel like what's most, what's most me is that first place. But, you know, obviously, like, if I were a better uh, pl plotter and organizer, I'd probably, like, you know, not be late with my taxes and, you know, my house wouldn't be a mess. And, you know, like, I'm not trying to <laughs> praise one side or the other. It's just kind of how I go, you know. Um, but when, so my newest book, which is not out yet, it's called Lovely War, and it's set during World War One. And this was an interesting challenge because I had to conform of certain events of the story within the actual historical timeline of the war. Like, I didn't invent new battles. I didn't invent new outcomes. I, I wanted to follow actual war events, and so I had to struggle to reconcile the actual places and times where major war events happened, and I had to channel Lucy Goosey Julie and her idea generation machine into these limitations, which 
is actually, it was stressful, but it's also fun. You know, it's also, there's something about like parameters that sometimes call forth our best work. Whereas if you have, you know, if you're gonna write a poem and you could write anything, that might or might not be helpful, but when you know you need to write a sonnet, there's something about that form mm -hmm. that's almost freeing. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, these are the boundaries, I'm gonna work within those boundaries, and that works. So, yeah. Who do we not hear from? <laughs> oh, um, I was, I was, <clears throat> I agree with everybody. Um, I think it also depends on what kind of book you're writing. Mm -hmm. And I like how you said, again, that um, y you let the free flow person go first. Mm -hmm. Which is important because as a writer, that's, that's why we write, because we, we like to just spill our guts out on paper. That's what I like to write. And um, my, my book, I, I, uh, I had a treatment, and I had a chapter outline, and the end result looked zero like it. it and I think my publishing company was shocked. <laughs> nothing like the summary. But for me, it worked, and that's why... I, also, for me, I needed a good editor to work with, which I had. She reined in what I had done and helped me make sense of it. Because to me, it made sense because it was my life. But she, as an editor and an outside reader, she helped me make sense of it. So for me, I, I think it depends on the writer and you, the person and what kind of book you write. If, if you are thinking about writing, writing and you want to do a summary or not, there's no right or wrong answer there. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, for sure. I'm very much a planner, of course, that's my job. Um, but, so I planned it out, and I was very surprised, actually, in the writing process. The parts that I thought would be very easy to write turned out to be some of the most difficult because they were very factual and very flat, and things that could have been written by anybody who maybe attended the event or had read about him historically. The challenge for me was to step aside from talking about the president in a very book reportish sort of way and bring him to life. And in fact, the first couple of chapters that I sent to my senior editor with Hachette in New York, who was so terrific and so supportive and so helpful for a first time author, kind of trying to bumble her way through this. And he said something to me that completely changed the way I approached the rest of my writing. And he said, Anybody can write about Ronald Reagan. He said, you know, that's a man that so much has been written about. He said, but do you know that this is a memoir? And so you have to write about yourself. And he said, people can't relate to being president of the United States, but everybody can relate to a part of your story. And so tell your story in a way that people can relate to you. And so that really changed the planning aspect instead of talking about things and about people and about events that happened, I unleashed what I saw and what I felt, and people have commented so much about the detail. They feel like they are walking into the room and seeing exactly what I'm seeing, and so putting myself back in there. And so there were elements that I thought would be very difficult to write about that turned out being surprisingly easy and accomplished other goals. And so, for instance, I was writing one day about, it was this beautiful day in Southern California. The president was looking out his office window towards Santa Monica where the planes land and the boats come in and out. And he said, oh, it's such a beautiful day. I would love to go to the roof and take my binoculars and look around and get some fresh air. And so then I talk about, of course, I said, okay, Mr. President, I'm happy to make that happen for you. And I go back to my desk and spend the next 15, 20 minutes coordinating with staff and Secret Service and scheduling office <laughs> and all of this to literally get the man from the 34th floor to the 35th floor. But it shows the detail and the logistics that were involved in my job. It describes my role in a way that I never could have just by saying, here's how my day went. But by using an example of one very seemingly simple, ordinary task, it showed not only the complexity and the difficulty of my job and all the entities that I had to navigate, but it also kind of showed his life of, the poor guy just wants to go to the roof and get some fresh air, and he can't just walk up the stairs and go. And so it accomplished both of those, and it's interesting because I travel and speak a lot, and the international community of executive assistants especially has loved this book because regardless of whether you've served the president of the United States or the president of a company, there's so much of that role that is in common. And so there's this common thought. So again, back to my editor, his advice was brilliant. People can't relate to being the president, but they can relate to one part or another of my job. 
getting married, having three of my four children while I was working for the president. There's a lot of working mom type stories too about showing up at the office, thinking I'm looking fabulous, dressed to the nines, and I realize I've got spit up going <laughs> all the way down my back. So things like that, be allowing to surrender to the process and to plan it, but then be willing to accomplish other goals along the way in ways that I found to be very surprising, but much more effective. So. Okay. All of your books are very different in genres and topics, but the majority of them have the same theme, secrets. Why did you choose to have your character or yourself keep a secret from others? For you, Julie Berry, your book is um, All the Truth That's in Me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, well, All the Truth That's in Me is the story of a young woman who lives in a small sort of like early colonial village and um, she has suffered a trauma prior to the start of the story that's left her unable to speak and because of that she is treated as an outcast in this small sort of rigid sort of religiously moralistic community um, and uh, so in some ways, physically, she cannot tell what has happened to her, but in a much more important way, um, emotionally and socially, she cannot tell because as soon as this event has happened, she's, she's discarded both in the way that people with different abilities can be discarded. She's also discarded as a young woman who is assumed to be now impure and is discarded as you know used goods. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of different, I guess maybe in a way, um, you know, both aspects of, of how we're, we're overlooked when we're young, we're overlooked when we're young and female, and we're overlooked if there's anything wrong with our speech. It all kind of come together. Well, this is beautiful. <laughs> Just awesome. listen to this. Um, so, um, so, you know, one thing that always kind of bugs me in a book is when a character has a secret that they totally could tell but choose not to. I'm like, come on. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you can only get so far on that before you're like, all right already. Like, quit being coy. It, there better be a darn good reason why you cannot tell. And so I had to really work on that and make sure that, you know, there was a very good reason why she couldn't tell she didn't fully know, nobody was listening, nobody wanted to hear, you know, she'd been so um, dehumanized by this, you know, maybe 17th century community that um, she had no opportunity to tell what needed to be told. But um, the story was about a lot more than just her finally revealing the secret. The story had a lot to do with her um, coming to see herself as having value and coming to see herself as being worth, um, worth the fight to regain her voice. Um, and then The Passion of Dulce is a story about a, a, a young medieval mystic woman who is deemed a heretic in southern France in the 13th century and sentenced to execution by fire. So that kind of made it easy, like, you know, <laughs> tell your secret, you're dead. So um, <laughs> it worked pretty well. Um, and, and it was a, a place in time when um, to help a person accused of heresy, to, to even do something as benign as to bow in the street to a person who might later on be accused of heresy, um, but that was enough. If, if, if you end up being accused of heresy and I have bowed to you in the street once five years ago, I'm now a heretic too. And you might think, oh, come on, no way. No, I absolutely guarantee it was that bad. It was kind of like McCarthyism on steroids, you know? So this, this period of inquisition, um, this mania into heresy, created this climate where everybody distrusted everybody. Because if you were friendly to your neighbor and then turns out later on that they were friendly to someone else who turns out later on to have been a heretic, you're all damned. And, and by damned, you mean, you know, if not killed, if not burnt at the stake, at least, you know, sentenced to house arrest for life, kicked out of the church, kicked out of the community, barred from employment, property confiscated, you know, the whole works, you and all your family and anyone you've ever talked to. It, it, it sounds impossible to believe, but it certainly created the right kind of environment for the kinds of dramatic tension that, as a novelist, I mean, I just I drink this up like Kool-Aid, like, oh my gosh. So, you know, when you find this kind of moment, when I do, I'm, you know, my, all my skin prickles and I'm, I'm like, there's a good story here. So that's kind of where secrets came into those two books. Um, so... You know, I find that when you're writing a book that's not a mystery, it still is helpful. Sorry, I just think this is really funny. <laughs> Can you hear us? Do we need to be like a little yeah. closer? Okay, great. <laughs> um, 
So I think even if you're writing a book that's not a mystery, it's still really helpful to have a mystery in it, you know, to have something that a character is trying to figure out. And so in my book, um, it's this family that's lost their fortune. It's um, the Wangs versus the world. It's the Wang family. Charles Wang is an immigrant who came to America from Taiwan. He made a fortune, bought a beautiful house in Bel Air. At the beginning of the book, he loses that house. And... So he decides that since he's lost his land in America, all that he wants to do is go back to China and reclaim the land that the communists stole from his family. And if you know anything about history, you know that that's basically impossible. <laughs> but that is his driving force. And he initially doesn't really tell his family that that's what he wants to do, but, but that kind of comes out. So there's a little bit of tension in that. But I think the real kind of revelation of the book is when he does get to China and he finds out what actually happened to his family's land, which I won't tell you now. You'll have to read the book. But, um, but it was really interesting kind of building to that and thinking about how that would work as a revelation, you know? <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, I think, um, you know, for anyone who... I think for anyone who's a writer out there, and also this is, I think, interesting for readers to observe, that when you're reading a book that does not kind of purport to be a mystery, look out for the mysteries in it, because I feel like that's always, yeah, it's always a good, a good tactic to use. Yeah. Um, uh, for me, uh, I was uh, first approached to actually write the book that, not, not the book that I wrote, but a, a different book. I was approached huh. to write a book about yoga. Oh. The, um, the editor who I ended up working with sent me an email one day looking, saying that she was an acquisitions editor who worked for uh, this publishing company, and they were looking for somebody with a yoga background to, work, to write an, an edgy yoga book. <laughs> and, uh, Yoga's so edgy. <laughs> an, an, an edgy kind of yoga book. And, and uh, she didn't know anything about me, and I feel like I'm going to cry if I tell the story. Oh, um, it's okay. Uh, I'll hold your hand. Not going to cry. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we got to know each other through email a little bit, and uh, I ended up revealing a few things about myself, that I had been an alcoholic when I was young and that I had recently been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, but I refused to talk about it. I wasn't going to talk about it in my book. Maybe a little about, bit about the alcoholism, but nothing about the Parkinson's. I was adamant. And she slowly kind of chipped away a little bit. And then I said, maybe one chapter. And she kind of did like the slow, uh, the slow push. Like you can't just write one. If you're just, if you're going to mention it, you can't write about it in just one chapter. And uh, I, I was writing according to that other, uh, the summary I'd written and it wasn't working. None, none, of, none of it was working in. I was approaching this one chapter I had written that worked about my illness, and the, the rest, it just, it, I was missing deadlines, and I was hating everything I had written, and it, it didn't sound right, it wasn't me, and I was, I was holding back a lot. And, you know, speaking of secrets, it was the biggest, I, I, had, I was under contract to write this book, and I knew I had to be honest. But I, I desperately didn't want to mention this one thing. So I'd missed another deadline. And uh, I, one day, my favorite writer was doing a, a book signing in San Francisco, Augustin Burroughs. And if you don't know, Augustin Burroughs wrote Running With Scissors, which is what he's most known for, and, and a lot of other books, called, one called Dry, my favorite book. So he was uh, doing a book signing in San Francisco. And my friend and I got in the car and we drove from San Francisco to see him and we were gonna drive straight home, which we did. We drove to San Francisco for two hours to see this man and drove straight home. Oh, wow. That's how much I had to see him. But he wasn't gonna be here in LA, so. We were sitting in a, in a room just like this in a bookstore called Books Inc. on Van Ness and uh, this was a couple years ago and he was, he was standing up there talking, he'd written a book called Lust and Wonder which is also a beautiful book. And uh, it, people were asking questions, and, and I asked him, how do, you, how do you get over the fear of writing about your life? Because he's, so, he's brutally honest in his books, and he doesn't hold back, and they're beautiful and compelling, and they're my favorite. And 
And I said, how do you get over the fear of writing about your life? And he goes, you know, you, if you want to, if you're trying, and I said, I have this project I'm working on, I can't get past the fear. And he said, uh, if you are trying to make it pretty, it'll end up sounding fake. You got to keep it ugly and real. Mm -hmm. Ugly and real. And I have it on tape because I have a secret, I secretly <laughs> tape it. <laughs> <laughs> I had pressed the video thing and, and I have it all on tape and he, and he just kept saying, keep it ugly and real, ugly and real. And I wrote home within 90 days, I had a very ugly and real book. Wow. So, uh, yeah, even less, actually less. That was in April. And it was due at the end of June. Less than three months I had my book. So that's how I dealt with that secret. Wow, that's a great story. I love writers. Um, <laughs> you know, I write about secrets because I find everybody has one. And there's a certain universality that goes with secrets. And it doesn't matter what age the reader is, everybody's got one. And so, you know, I write fiction. I make things up. But I will often want to take a look at something that happened to me. So I grew up knowing I, I was a lesbian, but I was in, it was the 70s. And, you know, I grew up in the surf culture, which is extremely patriarchal. I might as well have been in the Deep South. And um, if you were out, you'd get tarred and feathered. It, it was, you know, very much like, you know, being a heretic. You would, you, you talk to somebody who is out, then you could be considered out. And if you hung out with somebody who was out. You know what I'm saying? And the dichotomy of it was this place called State Beach. And State Beach was one of the most famous gay beaches where Christopher Escherwood and that whole crowd uh, frequented. And literally there was a 10 foot line of demarcation because the other side was this hot surf spot. So you had the um, the Hatfields and the McCoys. <laughs> and so that attracted me to the story. Um, I never wrote about my own sexuality. What I did though, and I continue to do, is I use my feelings. What we talked to when somebody mentioned method, and I grew up in method and Meisner and improv at the comedy store. So I will often use my feelings, but in a fictional way. And I just think secrets are the gateway to all great fiction. My job relied on secrets, everything from the president's schedule to his security to anything that was forward facing, went through a publicity office. You were, you know, we were very well trained to, to keep secrets. It was just part of what we did. Um, Ronald and Nancy Reagan decided to make very public a very private secret um, when Ronald Reagan was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And so I tried to take the reader into that room when I first learned that he had Alzheimer's, when it, it was actually given a name. I knew because I worked closely with him that something had been off and that something was wrong, but it was something that people didn't talk about. There was a lot of shame and stigma about Alzheimer's and so much more that wasn't known about it more than there was known. And so I tried to take the reader into the room. What did that feel like to have probably the biggest secret <laughs> and not be able to share that and to have it be so comforting and so terrifying at the same time? And then I also take the reader into the room where we, back in the day, are at the fax machine faxing the news release out to the AP, out to UPI at the time, out to all the outlets, where we know we are letting the genie out of the bottle that can never be put back in again. And this was something that Ronald and Nancy Reagan chose to do as public servants, to help and benefit other families who were suffering under the weight of that. But we knew that once that genie was out of the bottle, there was nothing we could do to get it put back in, and we had no idea the onslaught that would come as a result of that, and yet we knew it would be overwhelming. And I described then from there what it's like to have this secret out and to have this outpouring of love and affection and respect come back to me in a tidal wave. So where I'm trying to do my ordinary job, my phone is ringing off the hook with people crying and sobbing and writing and sending gifts and letters and things that they loved this man so much. Um, and I was very young. I mean, I was in my 20s when I worked for this man. And so to feel the weight of the world 
on my shoulders. Here was a man who had built a public persona and a public life that I wanted to be a good steward of and live up to that. And so there were a lot of secrets. And in the book, my challenge was to be revealing because there's no value in telling a story that's not revealing, but ultimately to be respectful because at some point my story ends and part of that is his story to, to tell or to not. And so it was finding that beautiful line between revelation and not getting to the point where the reader felt like, oh, I really don't want to know that. Um, so I go through the public facing parts of that. And then I talk about some very private moments um, up at President Reagan's house after he had left the public eye and before he passed away uh, because I wanted to show the beauty in a life that goes on even when others have dismissed it as not having value, um, which I think some others have alluded to in their story, and, and to show the beauty of a life well lived all the way to the end. And when others have maybe discarded them as being irrelevant or unavailable to show the beauty of that life, um, to show that relationship that continued with myself, with my kids, um, to stand at his bedside and to say my final goodbye to him and to do it in a way that I thought, you know, how many people in America and around the world would have loved to have stood at his bedside and to have thanked him for the way he served and led our country. And so, you know, finding that line between revealing and respectful was what I tried to do in telling my story. Okay, now it's time for audience questions. Does anybody have a question for any of our authors? Yes. I just tossed my journals. I, I'm not kidding you. I just took about 50 notebooks, and it was, it was extremely agonizing. Why'd you do it? Um, I did it because I didn't do it for my writing notebooks. I did it for my personal. Um, and I did it for two reasons. One, I'm getting ready to move, and I didn't want to bring them with me. And two, I didn't want my kids to have to clean them out someday. Mm. And it was sort of, um, this is called a death cleaning, even though I'm not leaving the planet. <laughs> there was just, I didn't need to carry them with me anymore. Mm -hmm. And it was an extremely bizarre and emotional experience. Uh -huh. Yeah, but not my writing notebooks. All mm -hmm. my, you know, black notebooks for novels and um, notes of, that I use for teaching. No, those those are here. That's so funny. I never kept one. I don't. I never really kept a journal. I as a kid, I would like get a new diary, and I'd be like, all right. Dear diary, I'm going to write in you every day. And then that'd be like the only entry. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have, but I do keep writing notebooks. Like I keep notebooks of kind of like interesting things that I overhear or something that I've been thinking about a lot and then I have like a new thought about it, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. So I kept a journal. Uh, I got a diary, Norman Rockwell diary for Christmas when I was nine. And I wrote in a, in a diary or journal just about every day. Now, this is really interesting to me. I always felt like my journal was a friend. Like, I talked to it as though it was a friend who wanted to hear what I had to say. And I'm like, I'm not crazy, but I just, I talked to my journal like it was a person. And I wrote every night before bed, and I have them all. And the day that I met my husband was the day that I stopped writing in my journal. Mm. And I, it wasn't like on purpose. Mm. It just happened that way. And I kind of believe that maybe he was the friend I'd been waiting to find. Mm. And, you know, that there was, Aww. like, there just wasn't. And I, I haven't stopped. Like, I still write in a journal now, but it's, you know, maybe every month or two. I just want to have a record of the family. Because I realize as the years pass that you really do forget stuff that you think you'd never f forget. You know, these moments, raising kids and, you know, the big play or the big, Vacation, you think that'll always be with you, but it's not. So I do try to keep a, a record, kind of a little more of a history. Um, but when I was younger, writing in my journal, and even as I've written since, I've been, you know, people would say like, you know, be careful what you write, because your grandkids are going to read that. And I was like, heck with that. I've always been like unflinchingly honest in my journal. Like, I don't like my kid, and I don't like my, you know, like, I mean, I just I lay it all out. And I do think that's been a really positive form of therapy for me. You know, just like I've always had this book that I write the truth in. Um, and I think it did help me to be a young adult author, because as I go back 
It's like, oh my gosh, you know, I love so-and-so, he's so cute. And it's like, I got really good at chronicling a teenager's feelings because that's pretty much what I did. Um, and I have always had, you know, writing notebooks and idea notebooks. But when I had to write Lovely War this past year, super deadline, super stress, super pressure. And I just felt constantly in over my head, like, don't know how to do this. What have I done? I'm not qualified to write the book I'm trying to write. And so I started something new, which was I wrote a personal journal of the process of writing this book, as opposed to like, you know, outlines and such things. I, I just had a journal where I'd say, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what to write about. I don't know who the character is, and it's due in six weeks. What do I do? I have 12 pages written. And that journal got this 500 book, 500 page book written in a few months, just by allowing myself to express my fears and my inadequacies, and I, I'm stuck and I can't finish and I don't know what to do and this is cheesy and it's trite and la la la. No, it's actually really good. You're gonna love it. You're gonna want to. <laughs> let's just be clear. But, <laughs> um, but I was able to say all of my fears about it in a very personal journal. And it, it, I, I swear it saved me. So I'm actually giving a workshop on like how to journal your way to your book because it was the missing piece. Like where has this been my whole life? Why didn't I figure this out sooner? That I can actually therapy my own way to the book I need to write. I can get it out and fix it. So, so yes. <laughs> when I started writing, I was looking back at 27 years of my life and I kind of regretted the fact that I didn't write a journal and of course my parents all along every day working for the president they're like I hope you're writing all this stuff down and I'm thinking I do not have one minute to write any of this down between life with him and my kids and my family I didn't and so originally I thought oh gosh it would have been so nice to have that but once I got into the process I realized that that would have been a crutch and it would have made the book very linear and boring and formulaic. I would have talked about who I met and what we did and where we went and all of that. But instead I had to look back 27 years of my life and say, okay, after all that happened, what did it mean? What did I really take away? What rose to the top? What stands out in my mind? Because even though there were extraordinary days, there were a lot of ordinary days when you work for somebody for 10 years. And so what really rose to the level to write about and talk about and to allow myself to feel it more than tell it. And I got to an especially difficult part of the book and had spent all day in my office with sticky notes on both doors, which the kids knew, you know, I need two hours, which turned into three or four, but I had poured my soul into this very difficult chapter. And so I turned to my kids and I said, do you guys want to hear what I wrote today? And they said, okay. So I'm sitting on my computer screen. They're all behind me. I can't see them. And I read this very difficult, kind of the pivotal chapter where it goes from this nice relationship and story to foreshadowing kind of what is ahead. And they're deathly quiet. I'm reading this, and I turn around, and all of them are in tears. I was like, is that a good tear? Is that a bad tear? And my oldest daughter said something to me which really struck me. She said, Mom, this is such a brave book. I'm so proud of you. And that really struck with me because it, it is that getting over that fear of talking about yourself. It's easier for me to hide behind the president and talk about him. Um, but it was very bold to step out and to have my daughters, you know, tears streaming down their face. Mom, that's a brave book. I, I re that really meant a lot to me. And so that was my process, I guess. I love that. Okay, are there any more questions? Yes. Yes, yep. My name is Pat Sides. And uh, I appreciate y'all being here today. But what I'd really like to know is how, I need tips on how to resist <coughs> rewriting what you wrote the day before so that you can move on. Because mm -hmm. during the uh -huh. lives that you've left yourself, you say, oh, that would be, I should have said that. And then you go back, and then you do it again, and then you do it again, and then you do it again. Well, I I have a question for you. How long does it take you to rewrite what you wrote the day before? Like, how much time are you usually spending on that, on that rewriting? Not too long, because I've uh, uh, put it together, and uh -huh. my 24 hours have gone off. I feel like it's okay. I mean, that's actually exactly how I write. I, I don't allow myself to rewrite what I wrote the week before, but I always edit what I wrote the day before. Like, I'm only allowed to go back one day, I edit that, and then I move on. But I, I don't really, like, get super deep into it. It's just like... 
clean up some sentences, move things around, that kind of thing. But yeah, I don't know. I don't really see it as a as a bad thing. I, I think you don't want to keep on rewriting the same thing over and over and over again. But if you just keep yourself to the day before, so how many I think you're okay. <laughs> so it's just, it's just one thing. Each, so you know, many. Writing is rewriting. Yeah. Yeah. But right, you want to get yourself to the end and yeah. then, yeah. you know. I mean, if your rewriting is stopping you from moving forward, right. then, then you just have to stop. You just have to, you know, I tell people, like, the way to finish a book is to add new words at the end. <laughs> you know, go to the end of the document and put the new words it's there. True. I mean, can, and I think we lose sight of that sometimes. But but so if if going back and editing is stopping you from putting new words at the end, then you need to just stop. It, it, whatever fixes you're thinking of today, you'll think of them three months from now. You don't don't be afraid that you won't remember or that you won't know how to fix it later. But but I do what you do. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm always combing back through and always going back and and I go back. You know, more than a day. I mean, I just, mm. I, I basically do whatever I feel like doing. Like, if, if, mm. if the mind says fix this chapter, then that's what I do. But the only time I'd intervene is if it's stopping you from moving forward. Mm. Words at the end, they're the best <laughs> words. I would just throw into that that rewriting it and reworking it doesn't always improve it. And so sometimes you have to let the, the most raw, the most authentic version of what you put, let it stand. And one thing I had to learn was to, Put things out there and allow them to be sort of open-ended. I'm, I like to plan. I like things tied up neat and tidy in a bow. And I had to learn to tell the story and let it mean something different to every person that read it. Let people take different things out of it. And I realized that by rewriting it, usually I was sanitizing it or cleansing it or purging it of the very heart that I had put into it authentically. And so reworking it I would say does not always improve it. Mm -hmm. And so be unafraid to let it be a little bit more yeah. raw and authentic and genuine and, and let it maybe be sort of open-ended and not tied up neat and tidy. Tough for me to do, easy to say, <laughs> tough to do. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much for coming, ladies. We really appreciate it. Your insights.